Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. Welcome to Revitalize and Replant. Ladies and gentlemen, so glad to have you with us. I'm here with my good friend, Mark Halleck. We happen to be in Atlanta, Georgia today. This is the 101th. <laughs> 101? 101th. 101th. I what like is it? 101st. 101st. But I like 101st. Does that sound right? 101st? That sounds odd. Well, we, now we've been saying this so much. I know. It's the 101st episode. <laughs> it's 101 episodes, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, that's what it is, and we're glad to have you with us today. We're going to look at, well, we're going to look at five findings about church conflict, mm. and then the next episode we'll look at five more findings yeah. because there are ten findings right. about church conflict. And I don't care where you serve, I don't care what part of the country you're in, I don't care how big your church is, how old your church is, how bright your church is, how dull your church is. <laughs> There's conflict. Yeah. Why Why do we have to figure out how to deal with conflict in the right way? Why, why is this so important? Because it never ends. Until we get to heaven, there's always going to be all kinds of conflict. We're broken. We're fallen creatures, right? There was conflict in the first century church, yep. and there's always been conflict. The issue isn't whether there will be or won't be. The issue is how do we navigate that in a way that glorifies God, and that actually the conflict becomes a catalyst for blessing. Mm, Let me me give you a a basic ground rule for this, a basic example. Uh, We talked about this yesterday in our meeting here. uh, I'm with Mark and our entire replant team, and we talked about this yesterday. That really the entire movement of um, missions in the New Testament began not with Antioch, but with the persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem that obviously forced many of the people to flee and take the gospel with them around the, the known world. But what caused the persecution? Well, I, you know, I, I remember a long time ago, uh, Charles Cheney was uh, my leader here at the Old Home Mission Board when I was in my 20s. Many of you remember Charles. He was one time president of, of uh, Southwest Baptist University in Bolivar. And I remember one time, how, uh, Charles was doing a Bible study, Mark, and he, he read that story of an Acts where there was this this unity between the Greek and the Hellenistic widows over the distribution of food. Mm. Now, I've heard this, you know, all my life, yep. but this is how he said it. And he took a little bit of uh, liberty with the story. He kind of said, I'm, I'm going to give you a possible story that was taken alongside when this happened. This is what he said. He said, I can imagine a conversation between two priests at the temple. And they said, did you hear about that new religious sect that follows Jesus that was crucified? And the other priest says, yeah, it's just one of dozens. They come and they go every day. Uh, They won't be here in a few years. He's dead. It'll all be over soon. And then a few days later, those same two priests are talking, and one of them says, oh, you know that new religious sect that follows Jesus? I have a neighbor, and her mother-in-law is in that group, and she's a widow, and she's a Jewish widow, and guess what? The Jewish widows and the Greek widows, they're at each other again. And the other priest says, well, it won't be long now. That'll be the end of that group. Nothing's going to survive those (laughs) fightings. And then all of a sudden, a few days later, those two priests are together again. And he says, you're not going to believe this, but I heard those widows are together, and they love each other, and the group is growing. And the other priest said, I think I'm going to go check this out, because this is what the Scripture says, Mark. After they came together over that disagreement, then many of the scribes and priests became believers. Mm. And I believe what my brother Charles Mm. Cheney said, that that was a living testimony, that if people can get along like that, there's something unusual happening there. And what Satan meant for evil, conflict, God used for good, because there wasn't a martyr until after that happened. Interesting. Because the church was not a threat, really, until the priests and the the, the, uh, others began to... To join That's the priests, right. the scribes, That's the priests. Right. That's right. And then they martyred Stephen, and mm-hmm. then they persecuted the church, and then the church dispersed, and then the missionary movement began. All of that to say, wow. conflict is part of who we are, yep. but God can use it for his glory if we navigate it Amen. correctly. Amen. That's so good. Okay, so let's look at these 10 findings about church conflict. Here's number one. Conflict is sometimes about issues— but it's often about personalities and preferences. It's almost always about personalities and preferences. Do you remember when, when Paul is writing to Timothy in First Timothy, he says, 
and he wants you to remain and teach sound doctrine. And he also said, so that they'll quit arguing over endless myths and genealogies. Yep. Now, nobody knows what that is. Mm. But if it was a doctrinal issue, Paul would have come down on one side or the other. Yes. Basically, they're arguing over things that don't matter and don't have any eternal significance. And that's what we spend most of our time arguing over. Yeah. We don't like the temperature in the sanctuary. We don't like the way the pastor dresses. We don't like how loud the music is. We don't like the schedule. We don't like that they quit having two services because I like to come to 8 o'clock, and now I only have one choice. We could go on and on and on. Most conflict is not over a major theological issue. Right. It's over a personality. I don't like that youth leader. I don't like the pastor's wife. Or it's over preferences. Yeah, I mean, Lawless says some people are naturally cantankerous and others have wrongly elevated their preferences to a priority. And that's exactly right. That's yep, exactly right. Here's, totally. here's number two. Number two, some church members are tools of the devil. Well, that is, this, you just have to. He's coming out swinging. He is. He never read. I mean, he is like a lion seeking whom he may devour. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And he, he wants to bring that church down because he desires to rob God of his glory. He's desired that since he was in heaven and he Come was on. jealous of God's glory. That's right. And so when God created the beautiful creation we have of heaven and earth and then the absolute epitome of his creation was man in his own image, what did Satan do? He shows up in the garden and ro- tries to rob God of That's that right. glory. And the most glorious thing on the earth today is the church of Jesus Christ. Mm. And so Satan is right there trying to rob God of his glory. And he does all kinds of things in our hearts and in our minds to make us believe that our— Remember when Martha yep. went into where Jesus was teaching? Here she is interrupting a rabbi. You just didn't do that, mm-hmm, let alone mm-hmm, a woman mm-hmm, interrupting mm-hmm, a rabbi, mm-hmm. right? And she says, Lord, don't you care? I mean, she actually accuses him mm-hmm. that my sisters left me to do all this work. Listen to me. Martha believed with every molecule of her being she was right, but yeah. she was completely wrong. Yeah. And dear church member— you can believe with every fiber you have that you are righteously right, but Satan has twisted your mind. And Jesus just spoke directly to Martha and said, Martha, you have it all wrong. You're the wrong one. Mary is the right one. Mm. And don't ever, there's not one of us above being blinded by Satan. Yeah. And you have to realize that some of your church members are tools of Satan. Now, yeah. the enemy, again, he, he says here, Chuck does, the enemy creates division among the people of God. He does it <laughs> through his people. Yeah. How else is he going to do it? Yeah. Of course. Yep. I mean, absolutely. And no person who's a tool of the devil recognizes mm-hmm. it, just like Martha did. Yes. And everyone accused of such comes out fighting even more. How do you mean I don't have a right to say yep. this? Yep. What do you mean I'm not like this? And then Chuck doesn't bring this out, but you and I both know one of the real problems we have in a lot of our churches today is we have unregenerate church members. That's huge. And those are literally wolves in sheep's clothing. That's right. That's exactly and right. And pastor, that's a tough, tough, tough decision. I, that's exactly right. Let me just read this. Romans 16, 17, and 18. I, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. So part of this reminds me of of the the protective nature of our calling. This is, we are protectors. And that's why this is weighty. This is a big deal. The naive, there are going to be those, it's not just children, but there are those in your church who will be easily led astray uh, by those who want to bring division. And so as pastors, man, we got to love the flock enough to protect. I was a uh, transitional pastor of a church not long ago, and they were having such huge conflict. And so we had a business meeting. I was not the moderator. The poor moderator was up there just trying to keep things under control. And it got out of hand. And people began to stand up on one side of the church and actually yell across to the people. And they got into a yelling match. And there were children present. Mm. And I just couldn't handle it. So even though I wasn't a church member, I was a transitional pastor, and I wasn't um, the moderator, I just went up and took the microphone from the moderator and I just rebuked them all and said, you've got children sitting here, and this is what they're learning mm. of what the church is going to be like? God forbid, you guys are in some serious trouble. Wow. You know, just sit down and be quiet. I mean, yeah. it, I, it's amazing how we get so incensed that we yeah. are so right that we mm-hmm. lose real cognizance of what we're actually doing. Yeah. And I love the fact that Lawless reminds us that division is among the people. Mm-hmm. So Satan, and he, no one thinks they're being used by Satan. Yeah, yeah. It is a, and as a pastor, you have to, 
fully navigate that and and in love and shepherding deal with that and, and embrace the reality that this is a tough, tough situation, but you can't run from it. You can't ignore it. Mm-hmm. You can't expect it to fix itself. That's exactly right. Number three. Number three, sometimes today's present tense conflicts, excuse me, present tense conflict is the we, residue. We just, you just had some cake. I know. Sorry. No, yeah. that's okay. So, it was good. Let me try this again. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes today's present tense conflict is the residue of yesterday's past tense issues. Uh, isn't that true? Man, that is really You know, good. sometimes we just sort of sweep things under the rug. We just move on. And yet beneath the surface, we've never, we have never come back together. Yep. We have never asked forgiveness of one another. We've never dealt with the core issue. We just cover it up and fake until something happens and that door gets jarred open and all Dude, that stuff comes, comes back out. Comes back out. Yep. And if you're a pastor that weren't, wasn't there when it first happened, you're going, where did all this come from? Yes. I didn't know any of this. Right. And you step on all these landmines you didn't even know were there. So a lot of times, the pre- and that's why it's so important to deal with issues up front. You know, our good friend, yeah. Claude King, has a wonderful book. Are you ready? Put this in the show notes, Mr. Beerman, please. It's called Come to the Table. And it's reality that we're not supposed to come to the Lord's table until we are ready to confess our sin and be one. Mm. You know how many times we take communion because it's the it's the communion Sunday in most Southern Baptist churches mm-hmm. is once a quarter because we don't yeah, want to do it yeah, too often. Yeah. Now, we do take the offering every Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, problem with that. No problem with that being too often. But <laughs> communion, yeah, we can't do that too often. I, oh, man, I'll get all kinds of heat for that. But— uh, yeah, we take communion maybe once a, once a month or once a quarter, but it, but we, we we take communion and we can still be mad at each other. We, yeah. we we come to the Lord's table. That's a big deal. That's a really big. Paul deal. Paul says there are some who are sick and dying among you because you came to the table with sin. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and so in in Claude's book, he really helps us take um, uh, some time weeks before our communion to make sure that our hearts are right, mm. that we don't have anything against a brother. It's called come to the Lord's table, hmm. Pastor. Maybe you use communion and say, you know what, we got communion coming up in about a month. We want to go through this study to make sure this time we're truly ready to take communion and maybe use that as a chance mm. to help deal with some of these past issues yeah. that people need to get beyond. Because the Lord cannot bless the church like he wants to right. until we are one in him. It's also why I think corporate prayer is so important. Because, man, it's hard to stay angry at somebody when you're on your knees. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Right. And so when we prioritize congregational prayer, we're, we are... We're, we're uh, not only empowering uh, unity in our church, but we're also putting a hedge of protection from the enemy who wants to destroy and bring division. And so we need to be praying for one another as well. Number four, a track record of short-term pastorates is usually evidence of a problem with the people in the church more than it is a problem with pastors. Can I just say, if you're in a church right now and you've had pastors of less than three years, maybe Three of the last four pastors have been there for less than three years. Take a moment and ask yourself, what is wrong? Because, brothers and sisters, that is not normal. Well, it may be more normal than we like, but it's not healthy. Let me put it to you that way. It shouldn't be normal. It it is perhaps more normal because there is a pretty short tenure among pastors. It is not healthy. And the problem may not be, probably is not the pastors you're calling. It's the situation they come to. Or if it is the pastors you're calling, then you have a flawed pastor search process. Mm. You're not really doing a good job of vetting them if you're getting these short-term guys who come for 18 months to three years all the time, one after another. There's a reason pastors don't stay long in a particular church. And it's usually the same people who are a problem there, regardless of who the pastor is. You know, uh, Halleck, uh, our friend Brian Croft talks about this. He says that short-term pastorates create a gap between pastors. And that gap can be six months to maybe two years, right? And in that gap between six months and two years, somebody fills the role of pastor. I'm not talking about the interim who comes uh-huh, in and preaches. Uh-huh. I'm talking about somebody who sort of fills that vacuum in that of, congregation. In that congregation yeah. And that person is not anointed. Yeah. He or even she yep. is not selected by God to carry the weight of that church, but they do anyway. And so it's not healthy, right? Yeah, so in true. fact, our friend Brian Croft says sometimes it's yeah. the church secretary. Because she's been there for 30 years. Somebody's got to hold this together. She holds, she's got all the corporate memory. She knows everything. And bless her heart, she's doing the best she can. 
But I mean, it's like she's been the. It's That's not right. the pastor. It's no, her, I know. I know. and all of that is dysfunctional. Yes. And so a short-term pastor, one after the other, creates some really unhealthy situations in a church. And so if that's your situation, you mm. have to look at that and say, wait a minute, whoa, maybe we need to reach out seriously for help yeah. from our state convention. Yeah. And I know some churches, they don't want to ask the state convention to help when they're looking for a pastor. Yeah. They think they can do it on their own. They think maybe the state convention has some agenda of putting somebody there. Yeah. Some churches don't want to look to their association. Mm. Same thing. We know we can do it on our own and, yeah. and, and or even go beyond that and talk to some other organizations, even some healthier churches Find a healthy, strong church with a strong pastor who's been there for decades. Go visit with him yeah. and say, look, would you maybe help recommend a pastor for us? Mm-hmm. All right, do that. But also, you've got to look at what is the systemic problem in your congregation if mm. pastors don't stay more than two or three years. Right, yes. I agree with right. Brother Lawless here. There's yeah. a problem there that has to be dealt it with. It has to be dealt with. Okay, finally, number five, and this comes off the heels of number four. He says, on the other hand, some pastors are the cause <laughs> Of conflict. (laughs) You know, for 10 years, I served as the state missions leader in the convention, the Kansas-Nebraska convention. And we used to sit around, it was just a small staff, and we would talk about the fact that, you know, we have some churches that absolutely kill pastors, and we have some pastors that absolutely kill churches. If we could just put those two together, they would kill each other (laughs) off. And you're right. There are some churches that do just chew up pastors and spit them out. But then there are some pastors that every three or four years they go, they go through the same cycle, yeah. they have the same issues, and they never feel like it's their fault. It's always this church's fault. Right. And and you may be the – and you know what? Yep. Not everybody who wants to be a pastor is called to be a pastor. Yes. Say that again. Not everybody who wants to be a pastor – is called to be a pastor. And I will say one of the hardest things in my life is to have a man who desires deeply to pastor. It's like his heart's passion. And I know he can't. Yeah. Now, how do you say, Clifton, you know he can't? I guess I guess I probably don't know 100%, but I haven't I, – I, 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 I know he can't. Can yeah. I just be honest with you? All right. You've watched him. I've You've watched seen him. him. You've I've observed, followed, yep, I've observed yep, him. Yep. It's not like I'm just making a it's not like because he doesn't dress right or whatever. Right, 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 I, I just right. I yeah. sense that that's and yeah. it's so hard for me to tell him and sit yeah. down and say, brother, let me tell you something. I don't know where this desire to pastor is coming from, but I do not see you in that role. Yeah. You need to be a church member, serve yeah. on your church different teams, volunteer. Not as a pastor. Well, and there's two. Can I say two things to that? Yes. I, I, as you're talking, I'm going. I think if there's two faces I'm seeing, one is a guy who who was in that same place, and and I said the same. You know, had that hard conversation, bro. I love you, man. You know, I love you, but like, I don't see this for you. Like, I don't think you're wired for it. I don't think you're gifted for it. I, I think you're really gifted in these other areas. Mm-hmm. And and I remember him saying, "Thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to go do it." And he was a train wreck yeah. and a pastor. I can think of a second guy who who responded to me saying, "Maybe you're right." And and over time, after he started to excel in a, a different career path, I remember him coming back and saying, "I'm so glad we had that conversation because you saved me years of of hard." And, and so part of that is if you're a leader. <laughs> We need to have the courage to speak truth into these young guys yep. and encourage the heck out of them, but also say, listen, man, being a pastor, this is not for everybody. Right. This is a calling. As Spurgeon would say, you know, the first day, his first lecture every year to his students was, if you can think about doing anything else with your life, go do it yep. because you're wasting my time. You're wasting yep. your time yep. and the Lord's time. But if you can't, if you got a fire that burns so hot— You've been affirmed by others in your gifting, then you're right in the right place. And you've got to be affirmed by others. Timothy yes. was affirmed by Paul. I mean, you've got to be affirmed by others. Yep. And it, you can't just say, well, I'm going to do it anyway because I want to, because I feel like God wants me to. But the last thing when we said that, you know, on the other hand, some pastors are the cause of conflict. Here, here's a red flag. If you are unwilling to consider your own role in conflict, that may be a problem. Mm. I think anytime there's conflict in a church and perhaps it ends with your leaving, you have to sit down and say, what was my role in that? Yeah. You, you know, or how did I not even handle the conflict correctly? Because I promise you, in every conflict in a church, Jesus has a way out. He has a way out. And did I not follow that way? What did I do wrong? What did I do incorrectly? Yeah. And I think we, it's a great time to autopsy those situations, guys, so that you don't go to your next church 
and repeat that very same yes. pattern over yes. and over. Yes. You know, we tend to have patterns in ministry. And some of us, you know, I always say, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a better date than I am a mate, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm better on the first few, you know, I'm better when you you're first in, get to know you're me. You're incredible on the front end. Yeah, on the front end. But man, long term, I don't know so much. Because, you know, it, it, again, you, you, can, you can promise a lot, you can, you can uh, propose a lot, you can have a lot of great expectations people like. But then if you don't follow through with those things, they become disappointed. And yeah. if you overpromise and you overcommit and you don't do what you say you're going to do, yep. they can become – and that's not their fault. That's your fault yeah, for overpromising right. in the first place. Yep. Or maybe you told your wife – maybe you weren't really as honest with her and your family as you should have been about how hard this church is going to be. Mm. You undersold the challenge because yep. yep. you wanted them to come with you. Yeah. And when they get there, it's much harder than you told them. That's on you. Yeah. So you have to see what what is my role in this conflict. Yep. Wrap us up and take us okay, home. Okay, let me I just want to I've got to recommend a book Go that ahead. I think is incredibly helpful yep. in light of this last one. It's called The Peacemaking Pastor and it's by Alfred Poyer and it's specifically if you're familiar with Peacemaker Ministries and The Peacemaker um, I'm trying to remember the author of that. Do you know that book? I do it's not. A, no. It's a really it's a best-selling book <laughs> called The Peacemaker. Anyway, but The Peacemaking Pastor kind of builds off that it's a biblical guide to resolving church conflict. Again, Alfred Poyer, we'll put it in the notes. I would highly recommend, I, I think every pastor should read this book, but it's incredibly helpful, and it's specific to helping you as a pastor not only look at your own heart, but how do you lead well through conflict in a unifying way uh, in the local church. So just uh, check that out if it's helpful. And, uh, man, that's all I got. Well, tomorrow, not tomorrow, but whenever the next podcast is. It's coming. <laughs> in a couple of days, uh, we got part two of this. So we have five more uh, issues of conflict in the church and how they deal with it. We all need help with conflict. It never goes away. But what Satan means for evil, God can use for good. We want to be here to help you grow your church, grow your ministry, live life better. Where do we point these guys? Let's give up, like, let's highlight a few things real quick. Our website. Yeah churchreplanters.com. That's plural, churchreplanters.com. And why should I check that website out? Because my picture's on there. Of course. And I got some videos on there. Beautiful man. No, I'm just kidding. I want to see you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> on that website, we do have some great teaching videos. Mm-hmm. We have some amazing blogs. There's actually a health, we can t- there's a health church survey, yep. church health survey you can take there. Yep. There's actually, if you want to be a replanting pastor, there's a survey you can take there. You can join the Replant Collective and you can get our weekly updates and all kinds of great information where we sort of put some good stuff together, blogs and videos, and send them to you. All kinds of great resources. Our team at NAM, the North American Mission Board, the replant team, has put all of this together to serve you. That's right. That's the bottom line. And so that is a website that there is gold all over that, and a That's lot of right. people don't know about it. That's right. And so we want to direct you in that. Churchreplanters.com. And then subscribe to this podcast and listen to us and share with other people. And hey, put it in the notes, man. Tell us how you want us to change or what other things we can do. We want to listen to you. Topics you want us to Topics, songs you'd like us to sing. We like to sing We would sing. That's right. (laughs) Old gospel songs. We'd be glad to sing some Southern gospel hits for you. All right. The Lighthouse and all those kinds of great songs. All right, man. Y'all take care. (laughs) We'll see you later. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.